Welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. Good Friday, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. It's the 22nd of August. As always, we encourage you to stay up to date with our uh, weather information, whether you're in Anchorage, uh, Susitna Valley, out in southwest along the Alaska Penn, out around uh, YK, uh, the interior, the Arctic Slope, or perhaps southeastern Alaska. It uh, doesn't matter where you are, you can find your weather information with NOAA Weather Radio or uh, find us online at arh.noaa.gov or more simply weather.gov and then type in Anchorage or Fairbanks or Juneau if you know exactly what region you're looking for. Once you do, you can bookmark that forecast and come back to it every single time. It's pretty easy to use the weather info line as well. Just give us a call at 800-472-0391. And as you're doing that, if you haven't used that system in a while, simply write down those numbers that you're using to get to the forecast that you want, and then you can just punch those in as you go a lot faster the next time around. You'll find us on Twitter, of course, on uh, Facebook under NWS Alaska, and on YouTube around 4 o'clock or so, you'll get your daily afternoon map briefing. And that just kind of walks you through the next uh, two, two and a half days worth of weather that we see around all of Alaska. So if you kind of want to wet your whistle for Alaska weather or you just want to get a sneak peek and run back out the door to uh, finish up with the fish, you can certainly do that. And of course, you'll find this complete broadcast online at our broadcast partners website, alaskapublic.org. And on YouTube, simply by searching AKWX-TV or Alaska Weather TV for short. Here's a look at the weather headlines we see around Alaska going through the weekend. We're expecting gales to crank up across the Alaska Pen tonight, mainly on the south side, and then in the western Gulf, including Shelikov Strait, tonight and into Saturday. Uh, watch for more rain as we uh, go into Sunday, especially across the southern third of the mainland. Rain will reach the interior probably by the beginning of the week, and we're still watching that small patch of ice up across the Barrier Islands just north of Prudhoe Bay. It's less than 30 nautical miles, but it is persistent and it's still there. We'll take a look at that here in just a little bit. Here's a look at the infrared satellite picture now. As you look out across the Gulf, if you watch the clouds kind of blossoming and spreading apart, the upper level wind flow in the jet stream is, is spreading apart as well. That is allowing air to move up from underneath. That's called divergence if you want to get into a weather book there. And that lift is going to help produce more wind and also more rainfall across the Alaska Peninsula, Kodiak Island, and a large part of southern Alaska. Eventually, it's going to make its way to southeast. You've seen a few more clouds today. You'll see more tomorrow. And then by Sunday, you'll have to start watching for some showers a little bit more along the coast than what you'll see for most of the weekend. For many in southern Alaska especially, tomorrow is going to be the better day of the weekend if you need to get things done. Out across the interior, we've been watching showers and thunderstorms blossoming once again in the heat of the afternoon. Places like Dawson City and all the way west have seen showers and thunderstorms firing up, some of those reaching the middle Yukon Valley and the Brooks Range. We'll be looking at more rainfall as well as we go through the weekend. Here's my favorite, the visible satellite picture. And once again, you can see the sunshine opening up for southeast and a few clouds sneaking in across the Dixon entrance. A swirl here across the Gulf uh, shows low pressures working in, but it's also drawing in drier air off the continent, and that's what you see here. A lot of ocean water sneaking through. Out across the west, another weaker area of low pressure is seen across the southern Bering Sea. The ragged west side of that uh, has a lot of dry air and stratus incorporated into that. That coming out of Norton Sound uh, into St. Paul. A lot of that is fog. There's been some rainfall around St. Paul as well. And once again, just like we've talked about in previous days this week, the, the rough texture that you see in the satellite picture across the mountains, the Kenai Peninsula, the Brooks Range, the interior and the Yukon Valley into Yukon itself is that upward moving air, the cumulus clouds, the big puffy clouds that sometimes you imagine as uh, maybe a hare or perhaps a musk ox, if you can kind of squint your eyes and look at it just right. Those are the ones that build up and turn into showers and thunderstorm clouds if they really get going. And many of those are starting to get going again across south central, the interior and the west, not to mention the Yukon and the Brooks Range. So uh, the simple safety rule to remember anytime, no matter what part of Alaska you're in, when thunder roars, go indoors. You want to seek shelter and move away 
uh, from that uh, thunderstorm as lightning can reach out from that storm cloud maybe 10 to 12 miles at most maybe even 15 on some extreme cases so it takes a pretty good distance to really be safe from that and you want to wait 30 minutes in your sheltered area from the last time that you heard the thunder or the last time that you saw that flash of lightning and again lightning is electricity of course and it can kill you once again, the visible satellite picture showing the progression of weather as we've seen it through the rest of today. But as we go ahead in time, you'll notice that uh, low pressure across the Gulf is working its way uh, north and east. High pressure is still in charge of the Gulf, but just barely. 1,027 millibars right now, right next to the coast. And as it's sitting there, it's gradually going to steer this low pressure system a little bit further to the south. So you'll see a better chance with rain from the next wave than what you see across the Gulf right now. Showers and a few thunderstorms again across a large part of the uh, open terrain of Alaska and more to come as we head into the evening. High pressure is also sitting just west of the Seward Peninsula. You'll notice it's pushing some warmer air up across eastern sections of Russia. Well, that is going to be short lived as colder air organizes fairly quickly and starts moving back down toward the Chukchi Sea coast. As we watch that progression, we're going to watch the winds change across the Arctic coast over the weekend. Keep that in mind. Nothing terribly strong just yet. We'll be watching that change up though as we get into uh, next week it looks like. In the meantime tonight, widely scattered showers and thunderstorms across some of the higher terrain, the Alaska Range, the Talkeetnas, and maybe a little bit further south. We're also going to watch fog develop around Cook Inlet once again, just like the last couple nights. Showers along uh, southeast will be very spotty. Most of that should be offshore. Here's our low pressure wave now as it works its way eastward. You'll notice that wave that we saw earlier across the Gulf has pretty much fallen apart. The focus will be south of the Sand Point area as this regenerates. This wave and frontal boundary will fall apart and the focus will be on the wave across the western Gulf. Pretty uh, similar situation to what we see a lot in the fall and this is a, certainly a, a, an ins instance that doesn't look too unusual. High pressure across the northern Gulf at 1,024 millibars should stabilize some of the lower atmosphere and don't be surprised to see fog with that. Showers across the Brooks Range into Kotzebue Sound are expected and even some light rainfall around Nome, so still warm enough for that. The low pressure out across the Bering is uh, losing that frontal boundary characteristics. Remember the front is just the leading edge of a different air mass, so as that moves forward we indicate that with the, uh, the pips and the on the uh, barbs here, as that moves northward, you'll see the direction uh, slowly work its way into the northern Gulf. But our friend high pressure system here, indicated with the big blue H, is stabilizing the atmosphere across the eastern Gulf. So it's kind of holding that back, just like we talked about uh, midweek. It's kind of like the older brother putting a hand on the lower brother saying, eh, not yet, you're going to have to go the other way. So widely scattered showers and storms are possible across the interior. Uh, you'll also notice there's plenty of uh, drier air thanks to high pressure up across the Seward Peninsula. So again, we're limiting that uh, quick onset of rainfall across southwest in the middle Yukon Valley. Showers should be expected across the higher terrain of the Brooks Range. And a cold front dropping southward from the Chukchi Sea uh, should reach the Chukchi Sea coast as we get into Saturday afternoon and Sunday. That's going to mean a switch in the wind and probably some showery weather along with that uh, increased breeze. Out across the western Aleutians, warmer air is already trying to make a run at Shemya. You can see that moving in off the Kamchatka Peninsula. And as we get into Sunday, it drops more south than east, so not a quick onset of that warmer air just yet. Low pressure across the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta is ashore now, and with that, a better chance for some lower clouds, maybe some increase in the breeze, and showers should be expected there. Uh, rainfall across the Alaska Peninsula with a west southwesterly flow coming in. The gales should subside as we go from tonight into tomorrow. And then by Sunday, uh, the winds should ease up considerably there. But the winds will start to focus more around the western Gulf, uh, east of Kodiak Island into the uh, western Gulf, just east of uh, the Kenai Peninsula and probably around the Barrens. High pressure is still on the chart, but this is probably the last day. Once this goes away, uh, the frontal boundary will move quickly toward the uh, northern and eastern coastline, bringing a better chance for rain, probably some wind to southeastern Alaska. But again, that frontal boundary is spreading out fairly quickly. The main core of the jet stream is still located across the western Gulf, so the focus for a stronger storm really isn't there yet. But, uh, you know, signs of fall are certainly shaping up. Out across the Arctic coast, a 1,016 millibar high is anchored there, and with that, showers should be locked in at least temporarily before that becomes a little bit more low stratus and fog. That's a walk through the charts as we see them today. Here's a look at the temperatures now. 60s and 70s for Southeast. What a beautiful day for you. 67 in Juneau, lower 70s. You get out toward uh, areas around Petersburg, a little bit down toward Ketchikan, Metlakatla. Hyder was 70 degrees, Sitka 64, Gustavus 63, Yakutat 59. Prince William Sound was in the upper 50s and lower 60s with uh, look like uh, 
Seward at 60, Homer 64, Kenai a little bit cooler, 59, you get stuck in the fog again, 65 degrees around Anchorage, Tal Keatna, 61. Fairbanks in the mid 60s this afternoon. Northway was showing 64 degrees. Looking a little bit further northward, uh, 39 in Kakovic, a little bit further east. Uh, temperatures were just a hair warmer, so once again, a little bit of fog kept temperatures down. But as you get out to the west, temperatures quickly spiked into the mid to upper 50s. In some cases, Akdesuk, in fact, almost hit 60 degrees, 53 around Barrow. Wainwright was 51. Kotzebue Sound saw a little bit of fog earlier today, 50s and 60s there, Shishmara 54. Tin City out on the Bering Strait, 49 degrees, 56 in a pleasant day in Nome. 50s and 60s for a good chunk of Norton Sound with 66 in McGrath. Tannenau was showing upper 60s as well. Galena 63 degrees and 63 in Bethel with Hooper Bay at 57 degrees. St. Lawrence and Savunga mid 50s today. Uh, St. Paul and St. George also still mild in the mid 50s there. So you've had a good string of uh, milder weather for sure in the Pribilovs this month. Uh, lower to mid 60s for a good chunk of the Alaska Peninsula. Uh, Sand Point was 61. Cold Bay and Falls Pass just shy of 60 degrees. Kodiak also showing mild weather today. And lower 50s for Adak and Atka with Atu at 55 by late afternoon. Now overnight lows will dip into the lower 50s again for the chain in the Alaska Peninsula. Look for slightly cooler weather though as you get out away from the coast. Kodiak sitting at 50 tonight, 51 around Bethel. Overnight lows in Unalakleet, 47, 42 in Nome, Kotzebue Sound in the lower 50s. With uh, Shishmaref, uh, Kotzebue and Kivalina all uh, cooling down a little bit from earlier this morning. It looks like Kivalina could dip to about 42. Lower 40s for the Arctic coast including uh, Barrow and uh, Prudhoe Bay and Dead Horse at 43, Fort Yukon at 44, 47 around Fairbanks, South Central in the upper 40s to lower 50s with the warmest weather, of course, right along the coast from Seward to Homer. Prince William Sound could dip into the 40s if you're in Cordova, 48, lower 50s for southeast with high temperatures tomorrow, probably in the mid 60s, 65 in Sitka, uh, even warmer for Metlakatla and Ketchikan, 64 in Hyder, 67 around uh, well, probably Juno up toward Haines and Skagway. So a pretty good mild day, but watch for those temperatures to drop on Sunday, of course. Upper 50s for uh, Prince William Sound, as I said, mid 60s for the interior. That should spark more showers and thunderstorm chances. Nearly 70 in McGrath and places like Galena and southward toward Caltag, 62 in Nome. 40s and 50s for the Arctic coast, 53 in St. Lawrence Island, 61 around Nunavak Island. And in the mid 50s to lower 60s for the Alaska Peninsula and the chain. Now, for flying weather, you're going to watch for IFR conditions around the Cook Inlet tomorrow. If you're flying along the coast, you'll likely see that develop over the water. Once you get inland, the uh, visibility should improve dramatically, especially the farther east or west you go away from the coast. Look for MVFR conditions to just graze Sitka and then move its way into a Dixon entrance throughout the day. IFR conditions along the frontal boundary that will likely reach the eastern side of Kodiak Island. St. Matthew, Pribilovs, and the western Aleutians will likely be under IFR conditions for a good part of the day, as well as parts of the Chukchi Seacoast just flirting with that poor visibility throughout the day and lower ceilings. Widely scattered showers and storms again for the upper Yukon Valley, generally north of Fairbanks there, but you might see some of that develop during the day. Past conditions in most areas should be under VFR, but let's take a look. Anaktuvik uh, looking at some convection during the day. Adigan Pass also VFR throughout the day. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass looking good so far for Saturday. Rainy Pass, we expect visual flight rule. Same goes for Windy Pass, and it looks like Isabel Pass should be visual throughout your Saturday and Saturday afternoon. Mintasta Pass looks clear at this point. Tanita Pass, good ceilings, good visibility, and Portage Pass is one exception. We may see some IFR conditions across the eastern side, remembering that the Cook Inlet will likely see IFR, especially in the morning, but that should lift. So expect some improvements, especially on the western side uh, as you get south of Turnigan Arm and then uh, across the eastern side, some improvements during the day. Now for Chilkoot and White Pass, we see improvements during the day as well, but starting out at MBFR. Freezing levels show that dip, uh, the colder air across a large chunk of the Bering Sea, and then much warmer air across the Gulf. Levels as high as 10, 12, even 14,000 feet. The Arctic coast, oh, a little bit of cold air there. Levels dropping to 6,000 feet by early tomorrow morning. There could be some uh, icing potential there, just grazing Barrow and areas north of Wainwright above 6,000 feet. That could reach light to isolated moderate. Probably a more sizable threat that will be right along that frontal boundary and just behind it above 8,000 feet. You might even run into some occasional moderate there, generally east and south of Kodiak Island, so probably nothing close to home. And then also uh, north and west of St. Matthew Island and north and west of Adak. That'll be above 6,000 feet out over the bearing. The jet stream is showing that uh, 
movement of air coming in from the south and west around high pressure anchored off the west coast of the lower 48. We also have some of that colder air. Remember we were talking about that jet streak where the wind came in a little bit stronger from the west. That's now pointed a little bit more to the south and east. So that's bringing in a little bit more colder air into the interior. The pattern's changing just a little bit as that trough is shifting further and further eastward. At 9,000 feet, our fastest winds are across the southern tip of the Alaska Peninsula. The central chain around 25 to 30 knots or so. Nothing too extraordinary across the interior at this point. More of a south and southeasterly flow at 15 knots. A stronger westerly wind across the Arctic coast between 20 and 25 knots. And weak low pressure just across the mountains from southeastern Alaska drawing in more of a northwesterly flow for the eastern Gulf. Light onshore flow for Prince William Sound about 10 knots or so. A little bit of stronger flow across the southern Brooks Range and from Norton Sound eastward north of the Yukon Valley at 20 knots and more of a westerly flow reaching the Aleutians at about 20 to 30 knots at 3,000 feet. So the turbulence potential once again mainly confined to areas along that frontal boundary below 4,000 feet, also around St. Matthew and just south of the uh, central Aleutians about 4,000 feet close to the Chukchi Seacoast and just working its way into the Beaufort below 2,000 feet there you might run into some light chop as you go throughout your Saturday. So uh, blue skies to you hopefully where you're going. That's a look at your aviation weather. We'll be back in just a few minutes with your marine forecast and a look at today's sea ice edge. Stay tuned. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Harry Keeling, and on behalf of the Alaskan Aviation Safety Foundation and Alaska Public Media, welcome to Hangar Flying. This is the third of three programs that I, I uh, taped for to bring to you the angle of attack and angle of attack indication system. Uh, I feel so strongly about this, I've, I've kind of changed the format, and I wanted to uh, talk to you directly about it. The first session we talked about the theory behind angle of attack and critical angle of attack. Last time we talked about how you could use it for everything from VX and VY. We talked about uh, best glide. Um, and I would, I would argue before we leave that point that if you lose an engine, you may or may not even remember what the, what the POH says about gl best glide. For my 185, it's 73 knots. But guess what? That is only good for one set of circumstances. And it can be eight knots different than that, eight knots slower than that, if you're at, at minimum gross weight. So when you're doing an a, a, a engine out landing, you don't need to be thinking about that. With the AOA gauge, all you have to do is know what the, the symbology is for that. And uh, let me just show you what that would look like. All you have to do is, is situate the airplane to show you that angle of attack and that's your best glide regardless of airspeed. Tonight I wanna, I wanna wrap this up and I wanna tell you why it's really important and it's not VXVY or best glide. It's gonna save your life from that loss of control accident. So I've mentioned before, 40% of fatalities are loss of control. They can happen in moose stall. They can happen in the traffic pattern. Let me show you what can happen here. So we're in cruise flight. And let's say we spot a moose that we, wanna, we want to see if it's legal, if the antlers are big enough. So we're down at 250 feet. We don't have enough, quite frankly, if the airplane departs, we're not gonna recover. You be flying your Super Cub, you may not have a stall warning. But if you've got angle of attack, let me show you what's going to happen. Okay, so you slow up. And so here you are about 88 knots, depending on your, your wing loading, depending which means depending on your Gs. Um, but you keep pulling back. Okay. Now I told you that's about what I fly final at, so... Um, you're about 75 knots. Now you keep pulling back more and more and you get that. Now, now you are at about 1.2 VS. Well, uh, you know, stall speed. Again, you're not concentrating on airspeed. You're not concentrating what's going on in the airplane. You're looking outside that moose. So you want to tighten your turn so you don't lose sight of this animal. What happens when you tighten the turn? your angle of attack increases. Now, this is where, this is probably um, 
60 knots. You ever see red on this gauge, you ought to be pushing the yoke or, or stick forward and reducing your angle of attack now, right? You ought to be briefing your passenger, whoever's riding with you. If you ever see this red on this gauge, poke me and say, Harry, your angle of attack is getting too high. But let's see what happens if you, don't, if you ignore this. This can happen if the, in the traffic pattern. How many accidents have happened where you have to make a last minute go around, you add the power, the nose comes up, the angle of attack increases. Watch what Get happens. Away. Now you've got an oral indication that you are getting to an area you do not want to be. You keep pulling back. You keep Caution, too slow. You keep pulling back. Too slow, too slow. All of this happens before you get any aerodynamic indications of a stall in your airplane. For example, if you've got a stall warning indicator, you have got all of this warning before that stall warning happens, before you get a stick shake or shutter or buffet or anything else. And shame on you if you haven't recovered before you ever get into that dangerous situation. You should have recovered long ago when you had the first indication you've exceeded what is known in this case, this is the symbol for optimum angle of attack. When you start pulling back because you're on short final and you're not paying attention or you're trying to track that moose and you get up here into the red and all of a sudden it's gonna be blaring in your headset and that's when you need, that's when you need to recover. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why I feel so strongly about this technology. It's, by airplane standards, not that expensive. Um, and you can have it put in your airplane, and it very well may save your life and the, and the lives of the passengers with you. So if you have any questions, please contact me. If you purchase one of these and you want some ideas on how to calibrate it, please let me know. Send me, a, send me an email at the Safety Foundation. Give me a call. Uh, I, I'd love to talk to you more about this, but I've got to tell you, I think this is a game changer. We may be able to cut that fatal and serious injury accident rate in Alaska in half, if not get rid of it altogether. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope this has been helpful. I really believe in this technology, and until next time, fly safe. Thanks so much, Harry. We'll see you again on Monday with more hangar flying. Here's a look at today's sea ice edge, and we are still watching those little bits of ice there, uh, about 30 nautical miles or less on the barrier islands north and east of Prudhoe Bay. It's still there, and it's rotting slowly, but it is rotting. There's a wealth of open water, of course, north and west of Wainwright and Barrow, and after you pass that, north of Prudhoe Bay and north of Kaktovik. So things are good, but we're still watching that little bits of ice there along the coastal areas. So. Anytime you want to see that, you can easily check it out at weather.gov slash anchorage slash ice dot php, and you'll find a lot of the tools you need to make a map similar to this, as well as a lot of information about the details and concentrations of the ice pack that you see well north of the coastline. Looking at southeast, looks like some fair weather as we get into Saturday. A north and westerly flow should be pretty light across the inner waterways, 10 knots with a two-foot sea there, light winds across the Lynn Canal, and a westerly but light onshore flow from Yakutat all the way down to Sitka, looking at more of a northwesterly parallel flow uh, to the southern coastline there with a four-foot sea into the Dixon entrance. Uh, we'll keep similar conditions as we get into Sunday, but the winds start to come up about 15 to 20 knots or so. Look for a northwesterly flow still inside the inner waterways and across the Lynn Canal. Now winds are coming up from the south about 20 knots with a four-foot sea. South Central still looking at fair weather for Saturday. Again, Saturday is going to be the pick of the litter as far as uh, better days for boating or just about anything else. But around Kodiak Island, you're going to see some changes there first, probably earlier in the day. Winds picking up uh, to low end gales there at 35 knots with a 9 foot sea. Easterlies east of Kodiak Island with an 8 foot sea, and easterlies also coming across the Barrens. So watch for some gusts in that region. As we get into Sunday, the winds turn quickly to the north and east and pick up speed 15 to 30 knots coming down Cook Inlet, reaching their maximum west of the Barrens. And we'll still have some gales in the region, uh, 25 to 35 knots or so across the western Gulf, 15 knots now inside of Prince William Sound after a pretty low event kind of day. Uh, for Saturday, the winds uh, will be a little, things will be a little more choppier inside the sound. So keep that in mind if you're heading out to catch some fish. As you look at the Alaska Peninsula, an east and southeasterly flow crossing the, the land there, more of a stronger flow in the Pacific side with a nine foot sea down the coast. 
four to five foot seas on the north side. Inside Bristol Bay, that's an easterly flow at 20 knots, becoming 15 knots from the south and west by Sunday as that entire flow reverses along the coast. Uh, south of Sand Point and King Cove, 25 knots with a nine foot sea as we wrap up the weekend. For the Aleutians, west and northwesterly winds are sweeping in behind that storm as it works its way across the chain and into the western gulf. 15 to 25 knots with 5 to 6 foot seas in many areas along the Bering Coast, 7 to 8 foot seas across most areas across the Pacific coastline. And as we get into Sunday, you'll notice not a whole lot of change there. 20 to 25 knots for most areas, down to 15 knots out across the western chain with a 4 foot sea for uh, areas between Kiska and Attu and southwesterlies across the Pacific coastline, about 25 knots with 8 to 9 foot seas. Across the west coast, an offshore flow from Mammonic down to Hooper Bay and Makoriuk, uh, 10, 20, even 25 knots there coming out of the Kuskokwim Delta, 5, knot, or five foot seas are expected. Northeasterlies around St. Matthew, southeasterlies around the Pribilofs at 20 knots with a 5 foot sea. By Sunday, you'll notice a stronger flow from the north and east coming out of Norton Sound into St. Lawrence Island and north of Nunavak Island as that's wrapping into what's left of that low pressure system and that wave or that frontal boundary that's falling apart. That means westerlies for the Pribilofs with a four foot sea inside the coastal waters and northwesterlies around the uh, St. Matthew Island waters with a six foot sea, four foot seas closer to the mainland coast. And across the Arctic coast, southwesterlies moving across the Chukchi Sea between 15 and 20 knots. Weak winds there north of Prudhoe Bay and a, a light southerly flow north of Kaktovik with a two foot sea. That should bring in some warmer air, but that quickly changes course by Sunday as that frontal boundary is working across the coast. You'll see a northwesterly flow around Prudhoe Bay and Dead Horse. We'll hold on to the southerlies north of Kaktovik, but we have northerlies working down the Chukchi Sea coast at about 10 knots with a two to three foot sea. A quick recap of your weekend weather shows warmer, wetter air moving northward across the western Gulf and through the Alaska Peninsula. Watch for some gusty winds and rain to move in quickly across the west as we get into Sunday, but the process takes time for the interior. A better chance of rainfall there by Monday. In the meantime, widely scattered showers and storms, clouds for southeast, and a frontal boundary crossing the Arctic coast. By Sunday, more rain in the southern third of the state and more sunshine in the north. Thanks for watching. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service.